Welcome to the 70th episode of Swift Focus, a film and TV podcast. My name is Simon Eady, and alongside me, I have my co-host and Duke Pinter of House Spider-Man No Way Home Hype, Adrian... Oh. Pinter. Did you forget my last name for a second? No, I, I thought... I don't know, my mind is all messed up. And <laughs> for some reason, I thought I didn't say other words that I was supposed to say in the intro. And so I paused and said, oh, for your last name. Oh. It made it look like... I forgot your last name was Pinter. Oh, oh yes, your last name is Pinter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is, man. How are you, Simon Eady, General Kenobi? I'm great. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, take a look at Banner, Michael. <laughs> take a look at Banner, Michael. Ah, Arrested Development. What a fantastic show. It's my favorite. One of my favorites, for sure. Yes. I just recently rediscovered that clip of Joe Bluth pointing to that banner and telling Michael to take a look at it. And, uh. I'm loving it. And I can't stop saying it, Adrian. I can't stop saying that line. I just blew myself. I was thinking, Simon, so I've already decided that I'm going to be Johnny Bravo this year. But uh, next year, I think, I think I'm going to go all in and be uh, Tobias Funke when he's trying to join the Blue Man group. Oh, my goodness. That is a lot. But that yeah. means, uh, are you going to like sh- half shave your head? I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go all in. Why not? Bald, you know what I mean? Bald cap? Bald yeah. cap or like you're actually going to shave because that's that's even crazier. I feel like a bald cap is like better, but I don't know. Maybe I'll shave it. Who who cares? Who do I have to impress, Simon? Nobody. Nobody. So I might do it. And I feel like if I go all in on that dedication, it's a relatively easy costume. I just need a lot of blue body paint and jorts mm. and I guess glasses. I see. That would be incredible. Yeah. I look forward to this. Um, just for context for the audience... Um, it is actually the day after Halloween that this is launched. So mm-hmm. it might be a little bit confusing because you just said, I decided to go with Johnny Bravo this year, but mm-hmm. you'd already done it theoretically, unless you're also going to a Halloween party on the Monday, the 1st of November, which I doubt it, but I, I could, but I'm not going to. Okay. Okay. This is the Halloween mm-hmm. episode, baby. Halloween, all Hallows Eve Eve is when we're recording this. Thank you very much for adjusting the schedule. To meet my needs and wants, Simon, I appreciate you. You're always looking out for me. Of course. Of course. You're very, very welcome. Adrian, I don't have anything to share or talk about when it comes to Spider-Man No Way Home hype this week. I I don't know if you have something, but I I did want to talk about another Marvel Cinematic Universe hype vehicle thing. Yeah? Hmm. I did. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Never heard of it. Bill Murray was in an interview uh, with a German newspaper because he stars in a little little movie called The French Dispatch, which we can't get here yet for where we live in Canada. Uh -uh. But he specifically was interviewed for The French Dispatch, and he revealed something weird. He, I think he slipped up that, or slipped and said that he is actually a part of a a, a Marvel movie. And uh, I got the quote here, so I can just read it out to make it less ambiguous okay uh he said quote you know recently i made a marvel movie i got to know the director and really liked him very much he was funny humble and everything you want from a director and with the cheerleader story bring it on he made a movie years ago which i think is damn good so i agreed that didn't make a lot of sense the way it was written but this was translated by deadline the Mm. the publication but regardless i got the gist here bring it on was directed by peyton reed who's directing and has directed all of the Ant-Man movies, and he's going to be directing Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. So it makes sense that Bill Murray would be talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Interesting. Yes. I remember Bring It On. Yeah, did you like it? Uh, No, I don't think so. I don't think I've seen any Peyton Reed movie other than Ant-Man 1 and Ant-Man and the Wasp. What what else has he done? Let me look it up. I'm going to look it up. Peyton... Reed, R E E D, movies. So Ant Man. He did Yes Man, apparently. Oh, yes. I did look this up um, mm. when I. Hmm. I was curious about the Bring It On thing. I looked it up a couple days ago. 
I'm yeah. forgetting. I'm forgetting. He did a lot of rom coms, eh? Yes. Yeah, I love Yes Man. It's actually quite good. Hmm. That scene with Jim Carrey and, and the guitar is particularly memorable. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't remember much of that movie. Again, I'm not a huge. Uh, I think I mentioned it before. I must have. I'm not a huge Jim Carrey comedy fan. I like his more serious roles, but the comedy ones, not really for me. You didn't like Yes Man? I don't recall it all that well. I know I watched it because uh, he's like uh, seeing that that song step off the ledge, my friend. Whatever yeah. that song's yeah. called. What's that song called? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Fuck. Exactly. Yeah, you got it. From that ledge, my friend. Uh, the song is called Jumper oh. by Third Eye Blind. Oh, that's pretty intuitive, actually. Our mutual friend Sinnet used to sing this song at karaoke. Ah, uh, Andrew, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. We call him Sinnet. We call him Sinnet. But uh, that's why that song is memorable to me is because of that movie, Yes Man, with Jim mm-hmm. Carrey. It was a particularly memorable scene. Maybe you need to see Yes Man again. I do. Uh, I do enjoy it. Maybe I'll watch it. But what do you think about this? Bill Murray in a in a Marvel movie? Come on, that's cool, man. You can't get greater than that. Maybe he's playing King the Conqueror. I'm just kidding. Um, I wonder who he is going to play though. Actually, it's interesting. Is he going to be a villain? Is he going to be a good guy? Is he going to be old friends with Scott Pym or Hank Pym? I just switched Scott Lang and I don't know Hank Pym. Um, you know, like what, what's, what's, what's he's going to do? Is he going to be there? Is, this, is it just a cameo? Who knows? But this is definitely intriguing. Bill Murray is a gosh darn treasure. Um, so I'm all in for it, Simon. I'm all, I'm in. all in for it as well. I'm yeah. excited for that. And, uh, I don't know why, but it just, uh, it makes me reminisce of, uh, about how awesome it was that Jeff Goldblum was in Phil Ragnarok. Mm-hmm. That's what I keep thinking too, just because they're, they're kind of unique gems. Those two fellas. Yeah. In very different ways, but um, yeah. yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting. Adrian, I want to get off movies just for a moment. I know we're a film and TV podcast, but I forgot to ask you a couple weeks ago and last week yeah. about your nose. And I feel bad about it because oh. I, it, it makes me look like a dick because we don't talk outside this podcast. And I never asked to follow up to say, hey, how's your nose? Your nose was crooked. Your dog fell on your nose and her hard head dented your nose to a point mm-hmm. where it bent. And I yeah. want to know. Adrian, I want to know, and I think the audience deserves to know what yeah, happened to your nose, and uh, does it feel much better? At yeah, this I point? didn't think you cared to nose about it. Oh, that's it's clever. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, I, so I actually thought you were trying to say that I just don't care about you, but you're just making a, a clever quip, and I, I can take that. But anyway, how is your nose? Cha quip. Um, it's it's fine, man. It's still crooked. It might be permanently crooked. So I went, uh, I told you I went to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. They did, they did a referral to a specialist. And I went to a specialist, Simon Eady, on a Monday. Oh, it doesn't matter. His name what was Simon Eady as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, it's crazy. Crazy coincidence. I know. Lives in the same town as you, too. Uh, and uh, yeah. So the guy, like I sit in the, I sit in the chair and he's like, okay, like, yeah, I can see that your nose is crooked. And he's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push on it real quick. And I was like, okay. So like he goes and just pushes on my nose so hard. I literally yell like motherfucker, like to, to this doctor. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like I, I didn't like, you know, like it's, I, I didn't mean to direct that at you. It's just, this is very shocking to me. And he's like, oh, no worries. Like I've, I've heard worse. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to go again. And then pushes really hard on it. And I was like, oh my God. And it didn't move. And he's like, yeah, I don't feel it really moving. Hmm. I was like, yeah, man. Like I know. He's like, is it broken? And I was like, no. Like they told me after the x-ray, they're not. And it's like, oh, okay, let me check the x-ray. So he like opens up the x-ray. The nurse is there, gives me like a tissue. She's like, oh, I know you're not crying. I was like, no, I am crying. Like that was very painful. <laughs> like it's got. She's just she's trying to make you feel better. Like, you, I, you, you know, you're not, yeah. you're not a wuss. Yeah. I know you're not crying. She looks from side to side. <laughs> it's like, no, I am, I am actually crying from the pain that has caused that has been inflicted on my nose. Look, look, lady. I I watch Ted Lasso. I cry every episode. Don't don't try to don't try to sugarcoat this. Okay, it, this hurts. I'm a big baby. I'll cry to anything. You hear me? This tissue in my eye is actually irritating it, so now I'm crying more. Anyways, so uh, he checks like the actually He's like, yeah, it's not broken. Like that's weird. And he's and he's like, then he puts this like weird microscope up my nose. He's like, oh, like yeah, your cartilage inside your nose is like bent, like. 
So it's like kind of like crooked, but like the nose itself. A warped piece of wood. Yeah. It's like the nose, is, like the bone in your nose is fine, but the cartilage is broken. Like it's kind of like bent. It's like, so you have a couple options. Like you can, um, like he had this big, long tool that he had out. And he's like, I can jam this up your nose and try to straighten it out. Like in the process, I might break your bone to like, you know, fix your cartilage. And you'll probably have like really bad nosebleeds for a while. And then I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound appealing. And he's like, option two, you can have surgery where they'll like, you know, cut it open and like, you know, realign your septum. And he's like, but again, you'll probably have some pretty bad nosebleeds following that. And he's like, or finally, like if, if you're, if you can breathe out of your nose properly now, which I can, I guess the swelling went down. I guess the swelling went down. Um, I, you can just leave it. And I was like, well, those first two options don't sound ideal. So like, I'm like, what do you recommend? And he's like, honestly, if you can breathe, you should just leave it. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to leave it in that case. So I was like, I don't need a bunch of nosebleeds. And he's like, you probably wouldn't be able to go. Cause I like went before work and he's like, you probably wouldn't be able to go to work after this, maybe for a couple days. I was like, honestly, I don't want to miss work for just like a slightly crooked nose. And again, I just didn't see my deal. So I was just like, okay, whatever. I'll live with it. A slightly was crooked Was he going to do the nose. surgery like right there, right then? That's no. He was just going to do it? No. Like the, the one, the first option, he was just going to do it. He was just going to jam oh, this break. fucking thing up yeah. my nose and crack it into place. And I was like, that, like, that seems just fucked. It's like, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not cool with that one. And he's like, yeah, you could do the surgery. We can book it way down the line, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to do some nose surgery to like just realign my nose slightly. It's like, I'll live with it. I'll live with this. And he's like, maybe hmm. like over time, it'll just like audit, like it'll go back to its regular shape. Like it might just be swollen. And honestly, like I, I can tell it's crooked because I know my face, my perfectly, my old, perfectly symmetrical face, Simon. But now, you know, I put on my sunglasses, I look in the mirror and it's like slightly to the side and it drives me insane. But yeah, your face is Tom Cruise symmetrical. Tom Cruise symmetrical. Not, not as Tom Cruise symmetrical, but close. It's close. Like um, now or before? Before it was. Now it's not even close. Ah, now it's like, now it's like eight miles away from Tom Cruise's face. Um, I'm not really sure what Tom Cruise symmetrical means now because, yeah, anyway. Well, whatever. Well, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with it. Okay, cool, cool. I'm glad. Um, So, yeah, uh, uh, that's the whole rigmarole. I lost my train of thought. But, yeah, my nose is fine. It, it, it's this a little doctor, bit quick. This it doctor, it, it strikes me a little bit like, uh, have you ever watched Battlestar Galactica, like, at all? No, never. Like, the remake show. Um, no. There's a doctor in it who, who like, lives on these sh- on these ships because like they're they're basically trying to escape from the Cylons. That's kind of the, the premise. And you don't know who the Cylons are and, you know. You're, you're, they've, they've got multiple ships and they got like a medical ship or whatever. And uh, there's a doctor named Dr. Coddle who mm-hmm. works on these ships. And he just, uh, he doesn't coddle you. That's the joke, I guess. Ah. He's, a, you know, he's, he's a bit, of, he's a bit brash and he's like, he's very blunt and he doesn't really sugarcoat anything. He just, if, you, if your nose is broken, you just like press on it really, really hard. And it's like, is this, <laughs> did he even ask you this doctor? Was it okay? <laughs> or did you just do it? No, he was just like, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to push on your nose, uh, in a second. And I was like, okay. He, he, it was more of a statement than a question. Did he ask you, it, does it hurt at any point or he just kind of did oh, it? Oh, he knew then... it hurt. <laughs> okay. Cause I called him a motherfucker and I was like, I'm so sorry. Well at that point. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just wondering, like, you think you'd gradually go into it, you know, you wouldn't just like press on it really hard right away. He just went for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Yeah. So you're just going to live with a crooked nose. Maybe for now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Thanks. Adrian, let's get into some show clarifications this week. We don't really <gasps> have anything to correct. I don't think there was anything we made a mistake about on episode 69. So yeah. we can just we can just uh, make this quick clarification. And this clarification is based on a write-in. <gasps> so let's reach into that mailbag for a moment here, shall we? We ask our listeners to write into us with comments, questions, and corrections by way of Twitter or by email to splitfocuspodcast at gmail.com. And longtime listener, Kenneth Stadelbauer, wrote into us once again, and he said, Film fanatics, here is some background information about the firearms disaster on the Rust set. The crew had previously complained about working conditions, including 17-hour workdays. Not only should the live round not have been on the set, the firearm should only have been handled by a prop master armorer prior to Baldwin using it. The guns were left on a table and assistant director Dave Halls handed off the firearm used, declaring it cold. Hmm. 
Helena Hutchins was setting up a point of view shot during the rehearsal when she was struck. The bullet passed through her and struck Joel Souza, the director. This differs from the crow accident with Brandon Lee and that the gun involved in the fatal shooting of Brandon Lee was loaded with blanks. Shrapnel from a previous blank was still loaded in the barrel, making it a projectile when the gun was fired. Since the use of a firearm in that scene was last minute, it was filmed after the prop master went home for the evening. This sparked massive changes on how weapons were supposed to be handled on film sets. And Ken was nice enough and good enough to put his sources for this information. His sources are props to history, global news, NPR, and CNN. This email was overall signed Kenneth, and he's got a quote here as usual. Filmmaking can give you everything. But at the same time, it can take everything from you. A quote by Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu, oh. the director of The Revenant. That's really interesting stuff. I uh, I, I really appreciate the, that writing, Ken, in the context to that. Um, that's wild, though. There was more that came out. Did you read anything about it that was pretty like shocking? There was a there were some people who apparently talked to. I don't know if they talked to the police or just talked to some news organization. They claimed that some of the staff, the, the crew, mm-hmm. they had actually taken the guns, the prop guns, off set and were shooting cans. So they were loading them with live rounds. Are you serious? That's been that's unbelievable. That was the rumor that was happening. That, there was a, there was a, I don't know if it's just a rumor at this point because I think there, that's something that was, was claimed by – by members of the crew, but that was floating around uh, on multiple publications. Jesus Christ. That was the case, and that would be why there would be a a live round that wasn't just a blank. It was actually a a bullet itself, which is quite scary. Um, But then again, it should have been checked, and yeah. Yeah, that's awful, man. It's such an avoidable... um like thing simply put like an avoidable death and like i don't know it's it's such a bummer that that happened at all and i don't know that that's a wild story man and i actually didn't know about the crow thing like i didn't realize it was like a a blank that was shot out of like shrapnel left from a blank that was shot out i i knew blanks could like hurt people because they're like very loud and you know deafen people but i didn't realize like they could kill people like that that's that's a very they interesting thing there was shrapnel from a previous blank. No, no, there was a there was a shrapnel from there was another shot that they were shooting before, and there was a piece of the bullet left over that didn't didn't uh, discharge from the gun mm-hmm. with with Brendan Lee. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah, so that and then that piece was still stuck in the gun in front of the other blank. So the blank, mm-hmm. the force of the blank, which still is pretty powerful, shot out that piece of shrapnel. That's what Ken's mentioning here. Yeah. And that shot into Brendan Lee and he died. And it's weird because from my understanding as well, he went down and they didn't know until they stopped rolling that he wasn't faking it, which is crazy. Mm. So they had no idea that he was he was lying there dead, which is just so unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, but this situation, I don't know. We don't know for sure yet, but it kind of seems like negligence a little bit. It definitely does. It sucks for Alec Baldwin because he's handed a gun with a like a bullet inside. Like imagine that. We talked about this last week, but it's just so frustrating. And like there's so many points of of failure that I feel like they could have they could have caught this, you know, nip this in the bud. Like David Hall should have checked, but honestly, the armorer should know exactly what's in the the damn chamber. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's unfortunate. Uh, don't, uh, I'm not going to blame anyone here, but I'm just saying it's, it's, I don't know how it passed this many levels. Um, it's weird. We've been trained on heavy machinery and that we, 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 like we, in the past we've worked for retail stores that kind of drive around like a, a piece of machinery that will take down like uh, big boxes from up top, uh, like in the, in the steel and in, in the warehouse, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I call it the wave here in Canada and that unit, that unit, apparently there's like thousands of accidents every year it's unbelievable you, you learn in your training you remember this yeah i do and there's a lot of heavy machinery that i feel like that's the case like these these pieces of heavy machinery they get you know they get a lot of accidents mm-hmm. the reason i'm pointing this out is because it's actually rel- it seems like there's actually relatively very little accidents with these guns despite the fact that they're this dangerous because they're these prop guns are basically just guns mm-hmm so I, I'm not trying to make an excuse for it because there isn't one at all. This is like the most serious of serious things. But I just, uh, it almost surprises me. People just don't 
care that much about their jobs. You know what I mean? Like it's just unfortunate, but you, you, you find a lot of passion of passionate people across every industry, but you also find a lot of people that just don't really care. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm glad this doesn't happen more often, but I, I honestly think, yeah, just outlaw the guns and, and put the muzzle fl muzzle flash into posts. Like mm -hmm. just put it in with visual effects. Well, why do we need this? Since we talked about this last week, it seems like more and more people in the industry are just crying out for that concept of r remove real guns. No more, no more of these blanks should be used. Blanks or no blanks. It's just not worth it. Yeah. I know James Gunn, I uh, was like talking about this quite a bit and saying how like the the guns themselves aren't necessarily the issue in this case because it's so rare that anything like this ever happens and that there's so many other types of accidents on set that like just the movie industry itself needs a like a, a reform um, for safety on set. Um, so it's a fairly interesting perspective from him because he, he's not arguing like, oh, no, like keep the guns on set. He's more so arguing that like this is a bigger issue. Uh, that needs a larger change. So I, I don't know if you heard anything about that. I did see on Twitter. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. I did see the James Gunn thing on Twitter. The one other thing before we wrap this part of the, our show up here, the other thing that was really weird, apparently there were complaints on set on this rust set that there were blanks that were fired in an, in cold guns previous to when this went off. They weren't supposed to be having blanks in them at all. And apparently mm. they misfired and they stole up blanks in it when they weren't supposed to. And so there was actually a little bit of a cry out for like, wait, why isn't, you know, why aren't we safe here? This is supposed to be a cold gun. We call it a cold gun. Why are there blanks in this gun? Mm -hmm. So it's like they had kind of warning signs prior to this happening. Apparently that's something that was said in multiple publications as well. Um, like reputable ones. So that's, that's another, that was pretty early on in this process that that mm -hmm. was a, that was a thing they discovered. It's again, this is a yeah, this is highly controversial. I just wish again, like again, there's so many checks and balances in place and all of these sets. That's why that I don't know if you need ultimate reform. That's not really I don't know if you really need that. You need obviously need reform for these the producers in charge or whoever it is that kind of messed up here. Because there's so many guns and all of these sets, and not, no one ever has an accident like this. It's very, very rare. So like the the other accident we're talking about with Brandon Lee was like 30 years ago. Yeah. 40 years ago? It was a while ago. Before my time, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, again, thoughts and prayers to Helena Hutchins' family, because that's, again, it's awful. But yeah. yeah. Okay, Adrian. What have you been watching this week, my friend? Have you been Ooh. watching anything spectacular that I should know about? Yeah, Simon. You should know about it. You should know about the things I've watched this week. And to be fair... Um, some of these I technically watched last week. I just wanted to hold it till this week because I watched the sequel of the sequel of the original this week as well. And that is Halloween 1978, Halloween 2018, and Halloween Kills. I watched all three of those within the past like week and a bit. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. I was serious when I said this is a Halloween episode, Simon. I wasn't referring to the holiday, baby. I was referring to these movies. And oh. um yeah, actually, I was still referring them to the holiday. Uh, but uh, yeah, I watched all, all three of these and like pretty much back to back, like over the course of like three or four days. And uh, I really like them. I actually quite like these movies. I know you're not a huge horror fan. Um, have you seen any of these Halloween movies or any Halloween movie period? I have not. What about Halloween Town? Halloween Town? Yeah. You used to air on Disney Channel. Isn't that a completely unrelated movie on Family Channel? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 I've seen Halloween Town. Not a, not a very spooky movie, to be honest. No, I loved Halloween Town, though. I thought you were going to tell me about another Halloween Town that also has Mike Myers in it. No. The actor who's in... Austin Powers, yeah. Austin Powers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyways. I think we both didn't say the line that he says. Yeah. I, neither <laughs> of those are really lines. Sure. Hey, it's me, Mike Myers. I'm Austin Powers in this movie. Hey. That's yeah, the, that's the classic Mike Myers accent. Um, Michael, take a look at Banner. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I guess I'll, I'll start with Halloween 1978. So obviously this movie's uh, fairly old, like it's before my time came out uh, 43 years ago at this point. And um, hold up. It's take a look at Banner, Michael. I don't know why I keep messing this up. Take a look at Banner, Michael. OK, all right. Just to be clear, okay. not related to this at all, but Job, I got to get the Job lines right for Arrested Development. Exactly. Carry on. Sorry. Halloween Town. 
Go on. Halloween Town, 1978. Uh, but yeah, in uh, Halloween 1978, it actually like still holds up surprisingly well to a certain extent. There are some obviously like dated things in the movie uh, that don't necessarily hold up to today's standards. Um, most notably, the I don't know if it was just where I because I rented it off Apple TV um, and the audio for this movie is so like the dialogue sorry i should i should clarify is so quiet in comparison to everything else in the movie it makes it very hard to watch i literally had to have my like tv up to max whenever anyone was talking and then just like lower the volume whenever big things happen because the music itself was so incredibly loud so i don't know if that i looked online i was like is is the halloween 1978 audio like totally screwed up but i couldn't see anything online so maybe it was just where I rented it from or, or some audio issues. I, cu- I couldn't put my finger on it. This is the first time anything like that's happened um, for a movie for me. And it was very odd. So it took a little bit away from the experience. However, the music being incredibly loud actually added a little bit to the experience because the music in Halloween 1978 is phenomenal. Like it's so iconic and it's so terrifying. And honestly, the movie itself like still keeps that level of like suspense and 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 I, I was quite frightened multiple times in the film. Like it's a it's a horror classic uh, directed by John Carpenter. He also made the the music for the movie as well uh, that everyone know, knows and loves. And uh, yeah, again, like this movie holds up incredibly well. Uh, the, the the few things that I found like a little bit, you know, like dated uh, other than I guess like the dialogue issues uh, is like, you know, obviously some of the, the script itself is just a little bit like Eh, whatever. Not all the characters are very well developed, other than Laurie, who's played by um, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Sorry, and you know the the, the rest of the characters are pretty like two dimensional. There's not much going on with them. You know, all the girls really talk about in the movie are boys, like things like that. It's just kind of like eh, whatever. Uh, like I guess for the time, but um, the movie itself is again still quite terrifying, and and I like the story of it. It's a lot more tame than Halloween 2018 and Halloween kills in terms of the amount of people Michael kills. Cause he only kills like three people in the movie, um, which is kind of wild to think about. And, you know, it's like this big phenomenon, like, you know, and uh, Halloween 28, ta- uh, 2018 takes place literally 40 years later. And you follow uh, Lori, who is um, Jamie Lee Curtis's character that many years later. And, you know, it just kind of follows her dealing with, the trauma that happened to her 40 years ago. She's kind of a recluse, like lives in a house on her own and stuff like that. And um, I really like that movie as well. That one's a little bit more like Michael Myers goes on a killing spree and kills a bunch of people. And the way they kind of set up the story uh, to kind of, you know, be a direct sequel to this 1978 movie is, is really cool. Cause they, they, uh, I don't know if you know this Simon, but there's like five different timelines of the Halloween movies. And uh, they essentially just scrap all of that. And this new timeline is Halloween 1978, Halloween 2018, and Halloween Kills. Were you aware mm. that there was so many timelines in, in, in Halloween? No, I was not. Yeah, I like Googled it because I was like, am I, I wanted to make sure I'm watching this right. And yeah, there's like a bunch of different timelines. They've already done a couple of reboots. Are you saying like a multiverse? No, like the timelines of the movie going forward. So Halloween, Halloween 2. Uh, is like a like the the one that came out in the early 80s or late 70s i don't remember like those are connected and then i think it jumps to like halloween 4 and then like a couple other movies i don't know it's 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 you're referring to multiple universes is that what you're saying i guess so i guess so because it it branches off like one of them is true for one thing but halloween 2018 only relates to 1978 exactly some point between 1978 and 2018 the timelines branched yeah exactly let's yeah think of it like marvel um, well, and, it's not just Marvel. That yeah. could be this any time travel movie ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't always branch timelines, but you know, you, you have to think about that every time there's time travel. Yeah. So the, again, there's just a bunch of different timelines, but uh, re- realistically, in this reboot uh, movie, the only movie that matters that came before it is Halloween 1978. And I know they make like a little reference to like one of the other movies in Halloween 2018. And they're like, oh, like that never happened. That's just a story people told. So it's a little bit of a like a nod, I guess, towards um, everything that came before it without really using any of that material um, for like Halloween 2018. But again, it, it, it becomes really interesting. And 
And I think it does like a brilliant job connecting those these two movies together that take place so far apart. I really like that idea. Um, and again, Halloween 2018 is like quite terrifying as well. And then um, I'm kind of just breezing through the story. Halloween Kills, I went to watch it in theaters. It was out. I was like, I kind of want to watch it. That one is literally just Michael Myers murdering a shit ton of people. And it's awesome. It's literally just like the most... It's it becomes like more of an action movie. It's still pretty like terrifying at some points. Like there's a couple of like ju- like moments where I like jumped in my seat, but that one is literally just like Michael Myers murder rampage. Uh, I was right. I was really yeah. into it. I was and really. Jamie into it. Lee Curtis was like, I, if I recall from the trailer, she puts like this um, kind of like a like a giant sheet on the side of her house, mm-hmm. um, and it's like it's like stay away. Uh, it's a stay away on it, uh, and then. Um, her daughter comes up and she's like, when Michael Myers is there, she's like, take a look at Banner, Michael. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that That's exactly what happened. Uh, yeah. that, was a, that was a long, that was a long road to that joke. I liked it. I'm glad you did it. Let's keep that going. Yeah, yeah let's keep that going. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, I, what I failed to mention in Halloween 2018, you know, like not only do you follow like Lori, um, who again is played by Jamie Lee Curtis, but you follow like her daughter and then as well as her uh, granddaughter. Um, yeah, at least I got that part of the trailer correct. Yeah, which is which is funny because the daughter in um, in Halloween 2018 is played by Judy Greer, who is also in Arrested Development. Bringing it back, baby. Keeping it all connected. Oh, but it switches out in Halloween Kills. No, she's still the mother in Halloween Kills. Oh, it's still Judy. Oh, still Judy Greer. That's great. Yeah, yeah cool. except for the one scene where Will Arnett shows up <laughs> and says, take a look at Banner, Michael. We're going to just keep on doing that. We're going to annoy people. I was saying that Judy Greer said that because I was trying to rope you in because you're like, where are you going with this? I'm sure you yeah. thought that at one yeah. point. I did. You haven't even seen this movie. How would you know? I did see the movie. No, no. You were saying that to me. You're saying I haven't oh. seen this movie. How would you know if Jamie Lee Curtis put a banner up on her house? Come on. I, you're If you're getting lost, imagine the audience. I'm sorry, listener. I'm sorry. Anyway, what's what's going on with Halloween Kills? You enjoyed it. There's lots of murder. Yeah. It. Yeah, exactly. It's just like a a murder spree. And again, that Halloween Kills picks up exactly where Halloween 2018 ends. Right. And uh, yeah, it goes pretty crazy. There's some like weird controversy going on saying that Michael Myers is homophobic because there's like a scene in particular where he kills like two, like a gay couple. Oh. And uh, But I feel like he just kills indiscriminately, doesn't he? That's the whole point of the movie. Actually, they like that's literally one of the the main points of the movie is that he just kills indiscriminately. The movie starts off and he kills like eleven people right off the bat. And it's like nuts. I'm like, holy shit. Um, but yeah, like, and he kills like women and children too, as well as just a bunch of men. So uh, again, Damn. it's it's a it's a weird one. Um, again, that's one of those like vocal minority things, like making a controversy out of nothing. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't, again, I really like these three movies. I highly recommend them. Like they, they're, they're a romp and I think, I mean, they're definitely making a sequel, like I guess a fourth, fourth quill, um, coming out like after Halloween kills, like the way the movie ends is, is left fairly open-ended. And there's like a couple of like big surprises in Halloween kills where like, especially at the end of the movie where I was like, holy shit, I did not see that coming from a mile away. And, uh, yeah, it's really great. I really like these movies. I'm super into it. I don't think like. It's the greatest horror movies ever, but they are fun to watch. And Halloween 1978 is like very obviously a classic. I think it, yeah, again, holds up quite well. It's definitely worth watching to see kind of how like horror movies started. I do think like Alien, which came out a year later, is a better movie and like a better horror movie and holds up um, quite a bit better, honestly. Like I think Alien like still holds up phenomenally well. What do you mean? Um, horror movie started not not like started but you know like it's one of these like big horror movies this big seminal horror movie kind of like you know like i know like there's were horror movies before it. you know what i'm trying to say but uh yeah sure sure yeah i'm glad i'm glad you understand he's, a, he's an iconic character yeah exactly you know i mean like you know you yeah, know this like, this is a like, i mean this is a character that's been around since 1978 so yeah, exactly man so I, I, get, I get you i understand yeah he's he's like on the level of like a like a like a Freddy from like Nightmare on Elm Street or a Jason from. Like- I'm just trying to make sure you don't look at naive, if possible. That's that's my goal. I am naive. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm the first to admit it. Oh, but yeah. Um, but again, I recommend all three of these movies. Uh, Halloween 2018 is on Netflix here in Canada. Halloween Kills is still in theaters. 
Um, and it is available on Peacock in the U.S. Um, if you have a Peacock subscription, you can oh, watch no. that. Oh, no, day and date. I forgot about that. We didn't. We announced that on the montage, I think, a yeah. couple of weeks ago. But it, it's one of the few movies that are uh, – I mean, not one of the few movies. But it, it's doing very well considering that it is on Peacock actually. Like it's doing incredibly well. So that's good to hear. Okay. Uh, Halloween 1978, I couldn't find it on any streaming service, so I just rented it for the five bucks through Apple TV. I see. But uh, yeah, good stuff. I really like it. And I'm excited uh, for more. I'm excited for more. Excellent. But uh, If it's safe uh, to go to the theaters in your area and you want to see Halloween Kills, uh, maybe go to the theater. Support your local theater. Instead of watching on Peacock, you know, hmm. just support your local local theaters. Yeah. You know what else was in theaters, Adrian? No. The Last Night in Soho, the Edgar <gasps> Wright movie that we both got to see together. We were in the same theater. Of course, we didn't talk because we don't talk outside this podcast, but... Never have, never will. The Last Night in Soho. What did you think of it? What did you think of it? Simon, I really like this movie. Uh, I think Last Night, in, The Last Night in Soho is uh, a really great movie. Very well stylized. You can tell it's an Edgar Wright movie, even though it's very different from every movie that he's that he made before this one. Right. Um, yeah. I definitely don't think it's his best movie um again it's a mm. different genre he's trying new things but i still really really like this movie it's unique i haven't really seen a horror movie like this it's it's not your typical horror movie by any stretch of the imagination it's far more uh it's it's far more of like a psychological thriller slash horror movie um i would say than your like typical like halloween slasher movie um but yeah, I really like this movie, Simon. Uh, how about you, man? I uh, I loved it as well. And we're, we're going to do in a closer look episode that will come out later this week for mm. Last Night in Soho. Just because there's, there's some nice twists and turns in this movie. And I feel like it would be, you know, it'd be a disservice. And we just don't do it uh, to spoil it here. Um, mm. We just don't like to spoil things on our podcast for obvious reasons. We don't take pride in disappointing people. <laughs> so I do. But yeah, but yeah, we talked about this like last week about how annoying it is that Marvel movies seem to be spoiled mm-hmm. or more often now, um, even by Disney themselves. But uh, we don't want to spoil it here. So we're, we're, I'm going to talk in broad strokes. I loved it as well. I thought this was an amazing movie. Uh, the soundtrack is really, really great. As every oh. movie that Edgar Wright ever makes, he just chooses such a great track list that works so mm-hmm. well in the context of his movie. And um the use of music and their use of the record player and everything in the way that it's connected with uh, Thomas and Mackenzie's character, Ellie, I think it's just really brilliantly done. I think Anya Taylor-Joy's performance is amazing. Matt Smith, Diana Rigg, Terrence Stamp, really good. Um, yeah, I just, uh, the cinematography is really, really good. The choreography is really, really good. There's not much I disliked. There is one particular scene, though, that I did dislike, genuinely. And it's mm. in like in the three quarter mark in the movie and it almost makes a plot hole and it bothers me. And I don't want to say what it is because I do not want to spoil it. Um, but that's something that I'll definitely talk about on our a Closer Look bonus episode of Split Focus of Film on TV podcast because I think it is the only thing I didn't like. It, it, for like five mm. to ten minutes, I kind of questioned it at the three quarter mark of the movie whether I, I kind of didn't love Last Night in Soho just because of this scene. It made me lose a little bit of trust in the in Edgar Wright, but I feel like he redeemed my trust back when he concluded the film. So I think mm-hmm. it's good. And I, I don't know. I wonder if you know what I'm talking about, but the, there's just, again, it's one moment. I think so. With Thomas and Mackenzie that I was like, ah, she's an interesting, she's a conflicted uh, character. Uh, mm-hmm. co- confl- I, like she's, she's a person who's just trying to belong and it's an interesting tale there. And you, you know, of course she's the protagonist and she seems like a good person in the beginning of the movie. I'm not going to spoil anything, but you, you kind of want to root for her. And I, I just, again, this particular scene was quite strange in its, in its choice narratively mm-hmm. and Edgar Wright's choice um, for this moment. But yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, and if it is the same scene, I, I agree with you on that front. Um, it's weird. It's weird. But again, I think it's funny because the way it ends, the way the movie ends, I feel like it it kind of redeemed itself. It's still problematic, but it kind of it's funny that I I went I I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it in terms of Last Night in Soho as a film. And then at that moment, I was like, oh, ah, oh. it just bothered me so much for like five to ten minutes. And then the remainder of the movie was just brilliant. And I was like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, you took it home, didn't you, Edgar Wright? Edgar Wright is so interesting 
and you, you just mentioned it like this is nothing like he, his other movies and he hasn't really done a, a horror movie at least in the mainstream like this one and the it feels like the floodgates are open kind of thing mm-hmm. you know what i mean like he could just do anything at this point we, we have no idea yeah. what he will do next what will what because even with baby driver is so different from his like i can't remember what they called the trilogy but with Simon cornetto Peg, trilogy cornetto yeah the cornetto trilogy yeah, it's so different from those films with Simon Pegg. Um, I don't know if there's any other movie like Baby Driver that he's made. But even like um, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is very different too. Mm-hmm. Uh, genuinely quite different. So again, the floodgates are open. That's that's kind of what I feel like. It's just like, I don't know what he could do. He could do uh, another comedy. He could do like uh, a relatively serious drama like, uh, I don't know, Manchester by the Sea. We, we have no idea what he's going to do. But I, mm-hmm. I argue that no matter what he does, music will be a core piece of whatever film he makes next. And that's something that I can rely on and I love that he does every time. So, yeah, I agree. It's exciting. Yeah, this is uh, like last night. And so uh, like just uh, just goes to show like how confident I am in anything Edgar Wright is going to do. Um, and like, again, I'm I'm going to be at the theaters for anything he comes out with. I was really worried because originally last night and so wasn't playing at our Cineplex near us and i was like what no way in hell like, they're not going to play this movie and for whatever reason it didn't get it on the thursday night uh we went to landmark cinemas which is another like local cinema chain i guess maybe canada wide i don't know uh that we went to instead and then uh it is in cineplex theaters now on the friday but i was oh, i was good. quite confused yeah um but yeah again I, I i really love this movie uh, i did mention like this is probably my most anticipated movie of the year again it 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 reached that hype but i still like dune better i think dune is still my favorite movie of the year um but again i i really did love this and uh, i i think it's just so unique and thrilling and and the mystery throughout the movie is is stellar and i highly recommend people like don't watch any of the trailers if you haven't already uh go in blind and just enjoy it for the ride that it is i don't um it's funny actually i watched i think the last trailer and it kind of disappointed me because i thought it was going to spoil the movie mm-hmm. and i think that the cho- the choices in the trailer for what they show is relatively planned out it's very strategic and i really do appreciate that it kind of reminds me of watching shang chi and the legend of the ten rings when we when i saw the trailer there was one particular moment actually that is spoiled, which I really disappointed me. But they, yeah. uh, I don't know if it was Kevin Feige. Or, no, it was Simu Liu. Simu Liu, who's the main actor in that film, who plays Shang-Chi, was saying to somebody on Twitter, because they're like, oh, you spoiled the whole movie in the in the trailer. And then Simu Liu is like, no, no, no. You haven't seen nothing yet or you haven't seen shit, which I, mm-hmm. I appreciated going into the movie because I was worried about them having spoiled the, the movie because they showed Wong in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Um. So that was kind of disappointing. But then it turned out there was a lot more that we just didn't even guess at all. We just didn't know about. And I think you mentioned what a surprise Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings was because you just kind of didn't know mm-hmm. what to expect, especially at the last uh, like quarter of the film. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think it was strategically done uh, for Last Night in Soho in terms of the trailer. I think it. I, I don't think it spoils too much. But um, but yeah, if you can go and blind do it, I guess. If you if yeah. you. If you like Edgar Wright films, um, mm-hmm. Landmark uh, Cinemas. Just a, a quick clarification there, just to you know, throw this out there. Is it has forty five locations. Its headquarters are actually in Alberta, so it's not just Ontario, which I thought it was initially. So mm. I looked it up, and then it's it's covering Western Canada, Ontario, Central Canada, and the Yukon Territory. Oh, crazy! And they're not owned by Cineplex. One of my favorite territories. The second biggest theater chain in Canada. Cray cray. After crazy cupcakes. Oh yeah, that seems right. After after you may as well say it for the audience, just in case. <laughs> oh, I thought you said it was after the cinema chain Crazy Cupcakes. No, no, Cineplex. Oh, oh we got yeah. an American. We got American viewers here. We got uh, listeners. We got to make sure we clarify hey. things. You know, we 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 don't, we don't know who's listening. Could it be those uh, those a uh, thousand people in New Zealand. You know, because we're the second mm-hmm. most um, popular podcast in New Zealand, the country of New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. It's true. Okay, Adrian. That's great. Um, yeah. all, everything else for our review for Last Night in Soho will be found in our Closer Look episode, just because we just don't want to spoil anything here for obvious reasons, like we just said. Adrian, okay. anything else you watched this week? Oh, Simon. I watched one more thing this week, and it was a television show. Oh. Not all of it, but the first okay. season of it. Oh, interesting. And it was you. Oh, 
Oh, me? Yes, you. No, Simon, the, the Netflix series, you. I watched the first season uh, and a couple episodes of season two so far, but uh, I'll keep it to season one. And uh, this show, it's it's very surprising. Um, it's one of the creators is Greg Berlanti, who uh, who makes like all those like CW shows, um, like all the superhero shows. So it's it's surprising that this show is actually so good. Uh, oh. uh, we, we talk so much shit Poor about uh, we talk so much shit about those CW shows, but this is on another level. I can see you know how it kind of relates to that similar style, but I think it benefits from being a tight ten episodes per season, or at least season one being that, where it's you know it's not like this drawn out drama over the course of twenty two episodes. That's just you know ridiculous. Uh, it's this drama. In way that's way tighter, but it's just as ridiculous, I think. And I freaking love it. Uh, it's just as ridiculous as the CW shows, uh, in terms of like it's drama, like some of the things, uh, that are like said and how characters react and stuff like that. But again, it being so much shorter, I think it benefits from that because it's not like, huh. oh, th- this one thing happened, let's draw it out, let's make these characters mad at each other for like eight episodes. It's just like, ah, oh, there's a drama, and then that drama is resolved like fairly quick Hmm. and again it's a lot quicker and done so much better and i think joe's narration actually it's funny it lends itself to calling out the ridiculousness of some Mm -hmm. of the people in it to the point where it's relatable and you really shouldn't feel like you relate to joe (laughs) goldberg because he's a creepy stalker that (laughs) masturbates on a porch in the first episode across the street from the girl he's stalking and in that same scene an old lady walks at the building that he's standing on and then like stops masturbating and then helps this old lady down the stairs i'm like this show is unbelievable i was like this is the first episode what am i getting myself into Penn and Badgley, it, actually, if you watch any interviews with him, um, especially after season two started airing a couple years mm-hmm. ago, he's constantly trying to convince people to not like, you know, try not, not uh, kind of, uh, what's the word when you like, like? not ship. Oh. Uh, what's, what's the word for that? What the, what's the word the kids say these days about, you know, thirsting over, over, over Joe Goldberg? Oh, yeah. They, they, like the thirsty for Joe. Which is like he's like, don't do this. He's a freaking psycho killer. Why, why, <laughs> why do you like him? It's funny how much he hates Joe Goldberg, but he does a really awesome job in that role. I, in my opinion, mm-hmm. yeah, I love his character. Um, in in a yeah, in a weird way. Like I, I love his portrayal of this character, but again, yeah, like you said, like Joe is weirdly relatable, even though he's a goddamn psychopath. And I like sit there, I'm like, why do I like? His inner monologues to me are so funny. And I think this show is, I would consider this show a comedy realistically. It is a drama, but it's so funny. So many of like so much of the time with a lot of it coming from the narration in Joe's head. Um, And uh, just for context, I guess you is a show uh, that follows a guy named Joe Goldberg, who's like a stalker that just gets like super into this, this woman um, and simply put just stalks her. Uh, and the show kind of progresses from there and you, you follow this character closely. And again, he just talks to himself and tries to rationalize all the decisions he's making. I think one thing that kind of makes him likable too, is that he knows what he's doing is really messed up, but he's just, he's just like, no, I, like, no, this is actually the right decision. Like the reason I'm doing this is to protect her, blah, 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 blah. Like yeah, she'll rationalizations understand. are brilliant. Yeah. And uh, again, it adds to like this level of comedy and like, Again, he just sees right through people and just hates so many people. And, you know, the way like this girl that he's following, like how her friends act, like the amount of shit, like he just talks in his brain and, and you know, brain about them and just being like, ah. He's clearly extremely intelligent, which is the benefit mm-hmm. of the whole thing is that I guess that's why you can try to relate to him because his rationalizations almost make sense because what he's saying is smart in a lot of aspects. And then when he, <laughs> then there's the extremes. And that those parts, obviously, you should have yeah. an issue with, or you're thirsting over Joe, one of those. Mm-hmm. Which again, you shouldn't. Um, but uh, yeah, again, this roller coaster is just a wild ride. It's it's awesome junk food. Like I just love it. Like I'm eating it up. I'm I'm excited to watch mo- more of season two. Like I'm super into it. And I, oh, again, sorry, how far did you get in season two? Sorry, I missed I'm, it. I missed it there. Uh, I'm ha- uh, 
episode three. So I've only watched the first two episodes. Interesting. Okay. Season yeah, two. like the the show, it doesn't progressively necessarily get better. Season two, it at least according to critics, they didn't love season two as much. I really mm-hmm. liked it because it's very uh, different and it's yeah. it's awesome. And then season three is actually the highest rated uh, at the moment. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. But yeah, I, I'm really liking season two so far. And again, the the roller coaster ride of season one and where it ends uh, is just it's wild. Like I was watching that show, I was like, holy shit. And again, I think that's a testament to uh, the, the 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 charisma that um, Penn Badgley does uh, as Joe as a character. And again, it's honestly a testament to the the writing and the story, um, which again is is drama filled and ridiculous. But it's it's good. I'm into it, and I'm really liking it. And I'm going to keep on binging it. Um, and I'm I'm very curious to see where season two goes because, like you said, it's it's not really like a like a reboot by any means like a soft reboot or whatever but it's it's different uh, and i'm very curious to see where this story is going to continue going yeah um, they're not i would argue that the great thing about it and it's kind of the thing i was worried about going into subsequent seasons is i was worried about it kind of treading the same water over and over again and mm-hmm. i really don't think they do that i actually think that they they have original plot lines i read a review for season three i was actually talking about it quite negatively in that way um, I think I sourced that, that review somewhere on Rotten Tomatoes. It was one of the negative reviews. They were saying creatively they've they've kind of run dry uh, of any new ideas. But I don't really agree. I, I do think that they've kind of changed it up every season pretty substantially enough that it, it it's it's again it's it's not the Flash. Actually, that would be a good example of how mm-hmm. it's not a CW show. They're not doing the same thing over and over again. Where it's like. I'm 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 Barry Allen and I'm the fastest man alive except for another fast man in every single season of this show because the writers don't know how I'm supposed to fight against people that aren't as fast as me. Yeah, sure. The um, that's my review of the Flash. It's interesting, actually. Season three, as much as it's the highest rated by critics and certainly uh, certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, it's actually arguably the worst reviewed by audience. Oh. It's a bit of a, a bit of a toss up there. So just in case somebody, you know, was listening to this podcast thinking you season three is the worst season. I don't agree with that. I do think so far, I think we're on episode seven or something like that on season mm-hmm. three. I do think it's really good. Um, and again, it's changing it up in, in ways that I didn't expect. So I'm happy for that. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Cool. Uh, what have you watched, Simon? Um, what did I watch, Adrian? What did I watch? I watched two things. I don't want to talk too long about this because we did spend a, a bit of time on Last Night in Soho, which is arguably our, our focus for this week. Um, so I don't want to talk too long about the other things I watched, but I've been watching you, of course, season three, as I just mentioned. I also watched Ted Lasso, Me? and you've talked about... That was very delayed. I know. <laughs> I wanted it to be... Uh... Um, I thought you were like, Ted Lasso's you. I'm like, no, you're not Ted Lasso. I've been watching Ted Lasso season two, and uh, you had watched it, uh, like I don't know, a month ago at this point. Yeah. And you talked about how much you love season two and how great it is in comparison to season one, and you love both. But um, I just started watching it. I think I'm on episode eight or something like that. I just watched the Coach Beard-centered uh, episode. Oh, this show is the greatest. It's the mm-hmm. greatest show. It's one of my favorite shows I think I've ever watched. I must say this. It's so good and so positive and so lighthearted. The music choices that they use are are beautiful, I think, a lot of the time. It's one of the Mumford and Sons band members, the main guy. But I, mm-hmm. now I'm – Marcus Mumford? Is that his name? I don't know. Marcus? He does the music for the show regardless. I believe it's Marcus Mumford. I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm locking that in. It's my final answer, Regis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. My guess is Mumford, Mumford. No, it, that's my guess. son, Mumford. I'm lock, I'm, I'm locking that in. Mumford, it's Mumford's Mumford. son. Oh yeah, good call. All right, Mumford, Mumford, like Mario, Mario. Yeah, from the hit movie Super Mario Brothers, the live action. Yeah, Mario, Mario, and Luigi Mario. The last name yeah. is Mario. Did you, <laughs> do you remember that? Did you see that? Uh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, it's incredible. Anyway, um, so Marcus. Marcus Mumford, good music and good music choices throughout the the show, but it's like there's just so many moments that it feels like I think I've said this before when I was talking about season one. It, it kind of feels like a fighter, a fighter movie, like The Fighter or Rocky, in that you, you they, they keep getting knocked down, but then they pick themselves up, and it's about the the failures that you know help themselves get back up and defeat the the team they wanted to defeat, or you know 
fight their depression or whatever it may be. And there's so many different topics that kind of goes through. And um, I, I love the introduction of the therapist, uh, mm-hmm. like the doctor this season as well. It's season two is arguably better. I think they just like hit their stride in even even more ways. And obviously season one was fresh. It was a new show, but I think season two, so far for me anyways, is um, just as good, if not better. That's what I would say. Mm-hmm. And the Christmas episode. I did have a note here about the Christmas episode. It felt a little out of place because it was in the middle of August. Yeah, I, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it threw me off a bit. I was like, huh. Or September, which is still strange. Um, a good episode, though. Again, a good episode. A really good Christmas episode of a show, in my opinion. But yeah, love this show. Anyways, uh, I'll, I'll continue talking about it every week because I just love it mm-hmm. so much as I continue to watch it more. But other than that, I watched Invasion, which is another (gasps) Apple TV Plus TV series. Ted Lasso, of course, is on Apple TV Plus as well. Um, But Invasion is an Apple TV Plus TV series with uh, Sam Neill from Jurassic Park, Adrian. What? You've seen this, right? You've seen the trailer, right? Yeah, I have. I, I I thought maybe you would have watched it as well. Dawn really wanted to watch it, my girlfriend. The reason why is because she likes monster movies. And she thought, ooh, Alien Invasion sounds like it's completely up my alley. And so we started watching this. And basically what it is, is and they launched three episodes right away. They have a fourth episode we haven't watched yet, but they launched mm-hmm. three episodes on its launch day. And I, I, I kind of realized why they did this. They follow multiple people throughout the world as an alien invasion starts hitting Earth. I, like mm-hmm. The alien invasion pretty much starts as the, as the credits start rolling. The intro is, by the way, really good. The music is really good because it's by Max Richter from The Leftovers. He's the... The oh. composer for the leftovers, and you can notice that right away as you watch the intro, kind of um, the intro title sequence. Yeah, but they're following all of these groups of people, and they're very different people from all over the world. They're, they're following this like astronaut in Japan. They're following a, a, a American um, American soldiers in uh, in Afghanistan. They're following Sam Neill's character in, I believe, Oklahoma. They're they're following all of these groups of people, and you kind of get introduced to these uh, these people. And their stories and their families potentially and how their dynamic works within the context of their lives. Mm-hmm. And then they're hit with this invasion. And it actually reminds me most of probably Greenland uh, so far. But it's uh, so damn slow. And I it- can't put my finger on it. I love I actually really like it. A lot of it, what I a lot of it, I, I'm kind of liking the, the the TV series. But mm. it, it just goes through these like it's just so slow. Like it, it's not moving anywhere very fast. And I'm very interesting. It's interested. I'm actually invested in some of these characters. Some of these characters have made some pretty stupid decisions. And I feel like if you watch the show, you'll know what I mean. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I do like the way it's shot. Like every other Apple TV plus show so far, it's just so it's got such great production values. Every single one of these series, even if the, even if it's C and it has a, a narrative, a plot line that's arguably questionable at best uh, at some points, like C with uh, Jason Momoa. I, I find that, again, C's got amazing production values, amazing fight choreography. They hired, it seems like, the best people to do the cinematography, to do the costumes, to do the makeup, to to do the acting. They have amazing actors in every one of these shows, it seems. But do I do I recommend Invasion? I don't know yet. It's funny. Every time, every episode, I look over at Dawn. I look over at my girlfriend and I'm like, so do you like it? Because <laughs> it was her idea to watch it. And she was saying the same thing, the same thing to me. And our answers are pretty much the same each time. He's like, yes, it is very cool, the alien parts of it. And that and that that part is really neat. But what is it? <laughs> mm. You don't quite know what this show is going for, what it's going to end up being. Because it's just... It's not, it doesn't feel like it's necessarily filler, by the way, because they're following so many different storylines with so many different characters around the world that it, I don't know. I'm conflicted. Do I think yeah. it's good production values? Yes. Good music? Yes. Good acting? Yes. But it's, uh, it, it maybe leaves something to be desired in the, in the plot department so far, but I am very hopeful about it. I do think that there's, a, there's something here. By the way, this is Simon Kinberg. This is a show created. By I was just Simon gonna say. Kinberg. So I, I just went on Rotten Tomatoes because Simon King, Kinberg is he's attached to a lot of uh, X Men stuff. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, it's like, is he good? Hit and miss. Yeah, you know, he's very hit and miss. And I think he di- did. He direct Dark Phoenix. 
Uh, I don't think Simon Kinberg has directed anything. Well, I, I, I don't want to say that. I'm sure. I'm sure he's directed something. Mm. I thought. I did thought he direct Dark like, Phoenix? I thought so. I might be wrong. Uh, yeah, Simon Kinberg did direct Dark Phoenix. Oh, yeah, that's um, a bad movie. Yeah, it's not a good movie. Uh, and yeah, I, I looked up on Invasion on on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it seems like a lot of critics don't recommend this. It's thirty seven percent on the tomato meter, and then forty six percent audience score. So it's That's not good. Ridiculously low. Yeah. I don't understand. Honestly, I don't get it. All of the Apple TV Plus series, they they seem like they hover around sixty percent. And I've watched them. Like even the morning show, I think the first season, the first few episodes was rated at sixty percent. I was like, what? What are other people watching? Like this is pretty well done it's a pretty good drama mm -hmm. like I, i'm i don't really quite understand it and although again rotten tomatoes is, as if you don't know this audience it's a one or zero it's either would the would the specific reviewer recommend it or not and mm -hmm. it, it's a one if it's, they recommend it it's a zero if they don't and that's how they do the percentages it's not like it's rated based on they rated it six out of 10 and somebody else rated it 10 out of 10 and they take an average. They're not doing that. So that could be why there people are just kind of on the cusp of maybe liking it. It's possible. I mm. can't imagine it being, did you say 37%? Yeah. That's ridiculous. This is no dark Phoenix. Let me just say that. Well, dark Phoenix is 22. Yeah, that's fine. But anyways, it's, it's pretty insightful so far. I, huh. I, I, I'm curious. I'm I actually, I, I don't know if you've got the time, but if you have the time to watch invasion, I'm curious to see what you think about it. We're definitely going to continue <laughs> watching it. Yeah. I'll probably pass. To be honest, we watched the first episode and we we're like, Oh, we we're very intrigued. And we, we quickly watched the second one. Like oh, we okay. were not shy about that. Interesting. You're passing. Wow. Again, I thought you just, you're a monster movie guy. I thought you'd just be gravitating towards this as soon as, as soon as possible. But all right. Well, Sounds if good. there's no monsters, who said that? Are there monsters? I didn't say that. Are there? I'm not answering that question. Do you want me to spoil the show for you? Is it going to spoil if you just tell me if there are monsters or not? Well, do you think that Dawn would be watching it if there weren't monsters? I guess. I don't know. I guess you'd have to watch the first episode. It's just 40 minutes of your life, bro. Come on. Well, if they're monsters, then maybe I'll watch it if they're monsters. All right, that's enough about Invasion. Did you watch anything else this week? No, man, that's it. That's all. That's it. That's all. You're a liar. Because we both watched the same thing. We both watched a little trailer from Pixar called Lightyear. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk briefly about that. Just briefly. I almost wanted to talk about it at the top of the show because there's a stupid controversy on all social media platforms with, when it comes to this damn movie. People are upset that Tim Allen is not voicing... Buzz Lightyear, but the Buzz Lightyear in this movie, and I want to very, be very clear for any listeners who don't understand this, the Buzz Lightyear in this movie is a real person, not a mm -hmm. toy. Buzz Lightyear in the Toy Story universe, and which is the same universe, but the Toy Story, you know, toys is voiced by a voice actor. Mm -hmm. That's why it's Tim Allen and not... Chris Evans and vice versa. Christopher Evans. Yeah. Chris Evans voices the the real person, the real astronaut. And so that's, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Did you notice that? That is actually a thing all over the internet. Every single time I ever see anything about this movie, they're like, well, why didn't they cast Tim Allen? Well, why didn't they cast? It's just because people love Chris Evans. It's so ridiculous that they didn't cast Tim I, Allen. Yeah. And then they're mocking it up to be like, it's because Tim Allen's a Trump supporter. Like it has nothing mm. to do with this. Stop saying this. It's so dumb. Oh. Uh, yeah, that it's confused. I thought I thought that I remember that controversy happened when it, this was originally announced. I thought everyone just like understood. No, what the I, I was point just looking was. at the trailer. Something about the trailer, some post. I think Chris Evans posted on his on on his Twitter about how he animation animated movies have kind of shaped his childhood, had shaped his childhood, and he was really looking forward to this to recording the voiceover work for this because he was so happy that he could be cast in a Pixar movie. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of where I, I was noticing other comments about this. With many comments about the Lightyear movie, people are confused. And I'm like, how are you confused? Do you have a computer? Because you do. You have Twitter. So look in Google, on Google, what this movie is, or watch the trailer better yet. And yeah. You'll know exactly why it's a different voice actor. It makes sense. It makes sense. I get it, Simon. I get it. Anyways, what did you think of the trailer? I think it's cool. I think it's really nice. It's it's neat. Um, yeah, I'm curious. Like, honestly, it just had me intrigued. Like, I don't, I don't think it shows too much of the plot or really where this this movie's going to go. And I think that's, that's perfect. Um, I don't know why I thought this was going to be a, uh, a series, but obviously I'm wrong about that. I thought, I thought that's what they announced it as, but uh, I don't know. I'm glad that it's going to be a theatrical released movie. And 
Again, I really like Chris Evans. I think that's going to be really great. I don't know if you saw, there's like one scene that kind of parallels Captain America where, where Lightyear's like standing and he looks towards his like, you know, his, his, his astronaut suit, which is very similar to, uh, you know, Chris Evans as Captain America looking at his like Captain America suit in like the museum, which I really liked. I picked up on that. And I think the music choice for the trailer is really great as well. Yeah. Starman. Um, David Bowie. It's great. Yeah. I think anything I think, with that song, as long as it's a yeah. space thing. I, I I love the use of that song in uh, The Martian. I know you didn't love The Martian with Matt Damon, but um, I, I thought the music in The Martian is on point. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I really like this trailer. Like, I'm obviously sold. Uh, I'm gonna watch this. Yeah, I'm sold. I, I can't wait. This is probably yeah. most excited I've been for a Pixar movie in a while. I don't know why. I just it, it was just such a good, well done trailer. It was well shot. I just uh, I'm so curious what they're gonna do with this. It's such an interesting idea to approach. Like I don't know, Pixar can kind of do anything, and they they choose these really interesting plot like plots that you kind of they kind of surprise me the the creativity that they have i just love it anything pixar makes i'm on board but this is uh mm-hmm. this is exciting for me anyway is this the next pixar movie coming out do you know off the top of your head or i don't know that's uh, maybe yeah. a you looking it up situation because my phone has, look it up. has been stupid i don't know what's going on oh no uh turning red that's that's going to be the next one uh that's oh, coming out that? in spring uh they came out with that trailer a while ago we talked about it it's uh about that girl that turns into like this red panda it takes place in Toronto. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And it's being directed by uh, Domi Shi, who did uh, Pixar's Bow. Cool. Yes. That, that short film, which is, uh, we both cried in the theater watching that. So. Oh, speaking of crying. Yeah, we, I definitely cried during Bow. Ted Lasso had me crying on like five episodes. I made that quip earlier in the, about your nose and how we both cried in Ted Lasso. So, you know, I'm definitely crying if you're trying to break my nose. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I, I can't believe how often Ted Lasso is making me cry and it, it, it's almost embarrassing. I don't know why I just said that out loud. Damn it. Damn it, Adrian. You should be embarrassed. Um, let's, let's change this, the, the, the subject. Take a look at Banner, Michael. Um, yeah. Adrian, should we move on to the news? You know what, Simon? I'll move on to the news when you take a look at Banner. Michael. Oh, please. Let's begin with a small collection of more focused stories that have been particularly pertinent this week. Number one, as publication Variety reports, director Wes Anderson's Searchlight Pictures produced film The French Dispatch opened domestically last week in 52 different theaters and smashed the pandemic era record for average ticket sales per location. On average, The French Dispatch sold $25,000 per theater location on its opening weekend. Sony's Spider-Man spinoff film Venom Let There Be Carnage was pushed to second place with an average $21,300 sold per theater during its theatrical debut. Overall, the French Dispatch opened with $1.3 million in ticket sales, which was regarded as a huge win by Vice President of Searchlight Pictures, Frank Rodriguez, who said in a statement, quote, The French Dispatch is a jolt of electricity for the specialty box office, delivering record-breaking results in theaters across the country. These figures show that after a year and a half, art house and independent theaters have a superhero of their own in Wes Anderson. Oh, I like that. What has been doubly encouraging is the crossover results in mainstream theaters hungry for Wes's 10th film as well. We are thrilled that after several delays, moviegoers said it was worth the wait, unquote. Adrian? What did you think of this record uh, record breaking result? And I don't know what um, what mainstream theater he's talking about in Canada, but <laughs> we can't seem to find this movie. But uh, but yeah, yeah, within like a hundred kilometers of us, which is so frustrating. Uh, I think it's coming to theaters uh, next week near us, Simon. So maybe we can go watch it next week. Ooh, I'm uh, excited. Maybe uh, maybe on Friday. I don't know because I yes. think we're going to be watching something else on Thursday, which we'll get into. Uh, but I think this is awesome. Like, I, I can't wait to watch this movie. I'm super intrigued about it. And it pisses me off that we're waiting so long. And it's cool that it's breaking these records. Now, obviously, like it's it wasn't shown in every single theater. So people would have to drive to specific theaters to to, to get it like like to watch the movie. So it not being spread out as far. It makes sense that it's you know, it broke those records. Um, but again, it's cool that, yeah, like, uh, uh, not so 
um, like blockbuster style director is, is, is hitting it out of the park with this. And it's being very well reviewed. And again, the cast on this is fantastic. And it's cool that Timothy Chalamet is getting like this double like back to back sort of movie. They were literally released like Dune and the French dispatch were released on the same day, technically, which is pretty wild. So Timothy Chalamet is just, he's, he's moving up in the world, man. And it's uh, I'm, I'm happy about it. I, brief aside. I don't know if you've heard, but with Timothy Chalamet, he used to be a YouTuber called Xbox 360 modded or something like that, hmm. where he would talk about like uh, Xbox controllers and stuff like that. And like how he would mod them on camera, which I think is funny. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's a story that just recently came out. So like old videos resurfaced. And thankfully, it wasn't like old videos where he's saying like racial, racial slurs or some shit like that, which seems to happen all the time with people. Uh, it's it's far more wholesome, thankfully. Um, but yeah, man, what do you think about this? Yeah, it's cool. I'm glad they're breaking records. I just want to see the movie. I don't know. I think Wes Anderson should be mainstream at this point. It's strange. He's made 10 movies yeah. and like one of them... Well, the Grand Budapest Hotel has won a lot of awards, I, I, it's, or mm-hmm. at least got nominated for many. And it won a lot too, but yeah, it just doesn't. It's strange. It's like he is should be mainstream. I think of him almost like as a Quentin Tarantino type character in, in a way. Mm-hmm. He's got a very very distinct style. He's an auteur, and uh, people seem to know him. I would argue, yeah. like an Edgar Wright, as well. But Edgar Wright's movie, like Last Night in Soho, we didn't have to travel that far. Last Night in mm-hmm. Soho, it was in like. I mean, we didn't even have to travel at all. Apparently, it was in our neighborhood. We could have just gone there, but uh, I turned on my TV and it was just playing last n- night in Soho. Yeah, because you said we didn't have to travel at all, Simon. I was just following up. Okay, you don't have Peacock. I don't. Oh, it's not on Peacock, actually. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I'm getting movies confused now. That was really stupid. Get your head out of the gutter, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, take a look at Banner, Michael, and let's move on to story number two, as declared by Dune composer Hans Zimmer. On social media, <gasps> among others, Warner Brothers and Legendary Pictures recently announced that director Denis Villeneuve's second Dune film has officially been greenlit. Yes. As reported by publication The Hollywood Reporter, Dune Part 1 accumulated $41 million in theater ticket sales domestically during its opening weekend, with over $220 million made from international box office sales. Naturally, this box office result was considered to be relatively muted due to Warner Brothers' decision to launch Dune Part 1 on streaming service HBO Max day and date alongside a theatrical release. But as Warner Brothers executive Anne Sarnoff had promised, the possibility of a Dune Part 2 was not going to rely simply on the box office results. In an interview with Publication Entertainment Weekly, Denis Villeneuve explained that his dream was to develop three Dune films in total. He believes that to tell the saga of the Timothy Chalamet portrayed protagonist Paul Atreides appropriately, he would need to also adapt Frank Herbert's second Dune novel, Dune Messiah. Mm. Specifically, Villeneuve says... Quote, I always envisioned three movies. It's not that I want to do a franchise, but this is Dune, and Dune is a huge story. In order to honor it, I think you would need at least three movies. That would be the dream. To follow Paul Atreides and his full arc would be nice. Unquote. Ooh. Adrian, thoughts on this? Of course, you did love Dune quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if they will get three movies just based on the cagey relationship between Den- Denis Villeneuve and, and Warner Brothers. But uh, yeah. what are you thinking about this whole story? I think this is awesome. Like, I love Dune Part 1. Uh, it, again, it's my favorite movie of the year thus far, and uh, I'm very excited about it. Um, and the idea that it's coming out I, – I said uh, on last week's podcast where we're, we reviewed it, where I was like, oh, man, it sucks that we're going to have to wait three years or four years for this. Thankfully, it seems like we're only going to have to wait two because it's coming out in uh, 2023. Um, I think October 2023 or something like that. So that's really nice. Now, uh, obviously, I know nothing about the Dune novels, really. Um, I actually didn't know there was a sequel to Dune, <laughs> like that book, and that the story kept on going. I thought that was a one and done. No, Do no. you know much about Dune Messiah? Like, is it as well received? Like, what is up with that movie? Or sorry, I guess that book. Uh, I think there were six novels, if I'm not mistaken. Holy, whoa. Um, Frank Herbert's son actually wrote follow-up novels as well. Um, but I believe Frank Herbert wrote six himself. Okay. Um, and so what I, from what I understand, the movies, the, the, the novels kind of get more wild as they, as they go. They kind of get more out there a little bit. Um, I don't know enough about Dune Messiah. My brother 
I didn't read it. I, I read the first one and I'm just at the end of the first one. Actually, I didn't quite finish it yet. I just, I, I didn't have time and it didn't matter because Dune part one didn't even cross over the area that I didn't read. Um, but Dune Messiah, according to my brother anyway, and, uh, I went to Dune with my brother and a family friend and they kind of both don't love the sequels. Uh, so I don't know, I don't believe they're as well regarded, but it is mm-hmm. interesting that it does follow Paul Atreides. So it would be kind of cool if Denis Villeneuve could put his spin on it because he seems to have a very good perspective on the novels based on yeah. his apparent love for for Dune and how well the movie is is built. So I think that uh, I think it could be good regardless. I'm curious, actually. I, this is one of those things where if you read Dune Messiah, write into us and let us know if you think this is a good idea to adapt the, this book as well. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm genuinely curious i don't know um yeah. i wonder if i should read dune messiah i i also wonder though is warner brothers gonna do this i i don't know it's so weird that they hadn't already greenlit dune part two it it's it still seems strange to me in a world in which first of all these streaming companies are like building things years in advance they're greenlighting things before things even air like mm-hmm. ted lasso i believe was was greenlit before season three season two it started airing the uh, greenlit season three mythic quest was was greenlit for three and season three and four instead of just three and then seeing how it goes mm-hmm. it's uh th- i know these are tv shows and this is a huge blockbuster movie but when you look at lord of the rings as an example um well first of all the amazon series is unbelievable how much they spent on that but but when peter Jackson- seven billion dollars <laughs> it might be eventually <laughs> based on the number of seasons they might do but yeah. Uh, I think it's like upwards of 500 million now for, for the first season, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, but no, but in terms of Peter Jackson's trilogy, um, they greenlit like all three and they filmed all three, like Fellowship, Two Towers, and mm-hmm. um, Return of the King all at once. So it's strange that like, they prolong this. And you'd think at least they would just kind of look at the hype that they were getting for Dune Part 1 before it aired. Or even when they got like, hundred million dollars in the international box office before it hit the domestic mm-hmm. market, like in the, in North America, you'd think it would be like, Oh, okay, this is going to do really well. Why do we need to wait before we green light it? Let's try and get, let's try and get a head start on this because we don't want people losing interest by the time we get this done. Uh, yeah. I don't know. What's, what's interesting to me is like, I understand that it's a risk as well to just like green light both parts, but I imagine it would have been a hell of a lot cheaper if they just filmed these two movies back to back as well. Yeah, you don't you have think to you... fly people out again. You don't have to redo any of the sets again. I'm sure a lot of those sets are still there. You know, they did a lot of on, like on site shooting and everything like that. But I, f- I feel like if they had the foresight, they should have just again greenlit both parts. Let Denny Villeneuve do his thing, um, and and just they they could have probably saved quite a bit of money just by doing that. You know, back to back realistically again it is a risk maybe this first one would have flopped entirely and it would have been poorly received but it's just like have faith in in a director like denny villeneuve you know what i mean i'm realizing now though especially based on what you're just saying like Mm. his last movie didn't do amazing and it was it was a lot of money yeah that's true like that that is so good blade runner 2049 like you know the quality is there it is the quality but you need to make money and like warner brothers (laughs) is a business so yeah but at the end of the day you gotta make money like i don't know warner brothers is like one of those companies like they're making millions upon millions on their like dc properties and stuff like that like i feel like you like every once in a while you can let the artist do his thing and like Eh. make the amazing art house not necessarily art house maybe but you know what i mean they did. Um, they still greenlit yeah, part one, right? And they greenlit twenty forty nine. It didn't do well. It's not like they didn't greenlit twenty. Uh, like sorry, uh, Doom part one. They still yeah. trusted him to do it. Um, I don't know. Maybe they thought maybe he would fail. I don't know. It's 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 an interesting perspective. Strange. Yeah. Like think about Warner Brothers and how how much they needed to like be be prodded to release the Snyder cut. Yeah. Despite the fact that it already existed. Like Snyder took it with him on his last day of shooting when he he, he quit the film. Yeah, to no. be fair, the Snyder Cut, like they did do a bunch of reshoots for it and gave like him an additional budget to like finish it off. They did in the end. Yeah, but they were like yeah. pushed like to the brink by the fans. That wasn't that wasn't mm-hmm. going to happen. Yeah, fair point. That was like that was years in the making is like the fans wouldn't let up. It was kind of ridiculous. It's kind of unprecedented mm-hmm. to be honest. It just hasn't yeah. happened before that I recall with such a big budget film. But yeah, they did give it to him. Yeah, I I, I know. 
but I wonder if it paid off for them. I actually, I really do wonder about the the money they made on the Justice League Snyder Cut in terms of what because it, it was just launched on streaming on HBO Max. So yeah. I wonder how many subscriptions they signed up, how many people tuned in. It, it's a, I wish those metrics were announced. Yeah, I imagine it must like it. It probably didn't to do too well. Can like it? I don't know. Like for me, from the outside perspective, the way it's like one of the biggest, you know, tweet that like tweets and you know hashtags on Twitter being like, "Oh, restore the Snyderverse or release the Snyder Cut." Like it, it must have done well. But again, if them not sharing that information and literally having zero mention of it during DC Fandom, like it, it couldn't have done well. Like that's my perspective, at least. Hmm. Or maybe they're too like embarrassed to admit that it did well. Well, they uh, don't want to say it did well yeah. because it's going to push them to potentially restore the Snyderverse, which was trending just before DC Fandom went on air. Mm-hmm. So that's something they don't want to do. As as and I believe it was Anne Starnoff again <laughs> that said that she didn't want that. Yeah, fair point. Um, but anyway, all right. Uh, okay, <clears throat> let's go on to story number three. As reported by publication Deadline, the 46th annual Saturn Awards were presented on October 26th. The Saturn Awards are a Hollywood tradition that started in the 1970s and are meant to honor genre entertainment in film and TV. The voting membership is relatively quite open to the public for a small fee. Due to pandemic delays, the nominees were inclusive of films and TV series that aired between July 15th, 2019 and November 15th, 2020. Some notable winners this year on the film side were Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, which won for Best Science Fiction Film. Jesus Christ. J.J. Abrams, who won Best Director for his work on Rise of Skywalker. Oh my God. Invisible Man, which was named Best Horror Film. Joker, which won Best Comic to Film Motion Picture. Mulan, which won Best Action Adventure Film. Quentin Tarantino, who won Best Writing for his work on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Elizabeth Moss, who won Best Actress for her work in invisible man and john david it. washington who won best actor for his work in tenet mm-hmm. on the tv side of things better call saul won for best action thriller tv series star trek nice. picard won for best science fiction series and the walking dead won for best horror tv series Ooh. the complete list of winners can be found on deadlines website adrian the saturn awards what are you thinking about these winners winners and nominees i don't pay attention or i haven't paid attention to the saturn awards in the past but i did find it interesting by the way that so many of these publications like collider and deadline who are arguably quite reputable did announce and uh, report them and there were quite a few guests like you know there were people the recipients did show up to this award show uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, bruce campbell was the was the mc of the night which is oh, interesting. Neat. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Simon. Like, uh, I think some of the winners are well deserved. Like, I think Better Call Saul is fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I, me and you both really love season ten of The Walking Dead. Uh, you know, I think Joker is a pretty good movie. Invisible Man's awesome. I think Elizabeth Moss is fantastic in that movie. Quentin Tarantino winning for best writing, all that stuff. That's all amazing. John David Washington, etc. Um, however. The reason I chose this story, Simon, is for another excuse to talk shit about the rise of Skywalker and J.J. <laughs> Abrams. What the fuck is that? How could that movie win best science fiction film? How could J.J. Abrams win best director? Not best director for a sci-fi movie, just best director for Rise of Skywalker? Right. So the nominees for best director were J.J. Abrams, of course, because he won. Nikki Caro for Mulan. Mike Flanagan for Dr. Sleep, that uh, sequel of The Shining. Christopher Nolan for Tenet. Gina prince Bythewood for The Old Guard on Netflix. Quentin Tarantino for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And Lee Winnell for The Invisible Man. And J.J. Abrams obviously wins. Like what? How? Oh, my God. How the hell could J.J. Abrams win out of that? Now, how does the voting work in this the saturn awards is this is this by like industry people like the oscars it like what what is the voting structure for this because i can't i cannot fathom i cannot fathom how this happened it just doesn't make any sense you'd have to be an idiot i think it's sort of at the top you you basically just buy in and you can become a member and then oh yeah vote once you become a member i think it's like 40 dollars. honestly you can vote 
um, each year. So I, I did wonder, and I don't know how that works and if it's a bias and if you can't do that, but I imagine that like the cast and crew for any of these movies could just buy in for $40. It's not that much and try and get their movie to win. Um, they like, must have. Cause it makes the entire no sense. Disney staff was told to buy an in or I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how biased that can be. That is the only way, like, again, that is the only way I can see that happening. That, they, that Disney was like, all right, everyone, you're getting an extra 40 bucks on your paycheck. Everyone sign up for the Saturn awards and vote for uh, star Wars and JJ Abrams. Cause it just doesn't make any sense. I don't know though. Does the Saturn awards matter to them? It can't, they can't matter that much. It's like, it's a really relatively small, it's it's a relatively small award show. Like it's just a it's, it's in a small theater in LA. Like I, I don't know if it really matters. I I, I would like to but, point out though but, the best science fiction film nominees just just for a second year. Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker because it obviously won. Ad Astra. Oh my god. Gemini Man, which wasn't very well regarded. Lucy in the Sky, yeah, which arguably well. wasn't very well regarded either. Tenet, which is like okay. Terminator, you got to be Dark kidding. Fate was the last one, but Tenet didn't win, and that's that's the shocker for me. I think Ad Astra, I really like the the um, Brad Pitt movie. I could have seen that one. That's okay, uh, but Tenet is a shocker because Tenet was to me obviously we don't like Rise of Skywalker on this show, Split Focus of Film and TV podcast. It's a bad movie. Yeah, it's not good. There's nothing good about it. It's funny because Rise of Skywalker was also nominated for Best Writing. Thank God it didn't win. Imagine it won. I would kill myself. Imagine it won. By the way, imagine oh, that would have been more incredible because the writing, uh, who was nominated for best writing, you asked? Obviously, Quentin Tarantino for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because he won. It's fantastic. And then we got Mike Flanagan for Doctor, uh, Doctor Sleep. Mulan was nominated again, which I, I don't understand because I, I don't think Mulan was that well regarded, but maybe I'm mis- mistaken. Bong Joon Ho for Parasite. For Parasite? Oh my Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Bong Joon Ho, Parasite won for best international release. Um, and it wasn't nominated for Best Thriller Film, which I think it would have been in that category. Knives Out won for Best Thriller Film. Onward won for Best Animated Film. But that actually makes sense, I think, because there was not much. Um, Pixar's My Dad It's a Pair of Pants, that one? Yeah, Onward makes sense. Yeah. Mulan was weird, too, because Mulan won for Best Action Adventure Film, as I said. But it beat out 1917. What? <laughs> and... And El Camino, a Breaking Bad story. Oh, my God. Simon. 1917, of course, is the war film we... that's kind of done in one shot. What a great movie, man. That Yeah, that movie's fantastic. By Sam Mendes. Yeah. yeah. Simon. Uh, yep. I'm going to put this out there. And I want to I wanna see if, if you're going to agree to this. Yes. Can we never talk about the Saturn Awards again? <laughs> because I am angry. Dude, you chose the story, okay? I gave I you the options. And you chose the Saturn Awards story. Let's be honest. That's how our show works. Okay. You choose the top three stories and then we discuss. I know. I just hearing more and more about this. I'm just so upset and angry. It just doesn't make sense. I cannot fathom. I cannot wrap my head around. I it. was thinking of buying in and being a member. That would be kind of fun, but I just don't, uh, I don't want, I don't have the disposable income at the moment to do that. So I don't want to do it, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like $40. I think if you pay $500, you can go to the show in LA. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I would do that for, for a night. Christopher Lloyd won an honorary award as well. Hmm. Um, there was actually the honorary award that he won, if I'm not mistaken, was actually named after Robert Forster. Oh, that's and nice. Like, I think the first year they're doing that award. Robert Forster, of course, passed away and he he was the star of Breaking Bad and many other movies like uh, Jackie Brown and even Heroes actually was on the Heroes TV series. He was, yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> I can't believe Rise of Skywalker would win anything. It's just such not, it's the worst, it's the worst film <laughs> that I've seen in a while, probably. I, I, I keep thinking about it and, and the terrible writing that it has. And do you think it get, got nominated for best writing? It's just, it's, are we wrong? I, sometimes, again, I, I always think about this. I think about that Fargo poster in Fargo season one with Martin Freeman. You got that, he's in the, in the basement and there's a bunch of those fish and there's, they're all going one way and there's one red fish trying to go the other way. And the poster says as a slogan, what if, what if they're right and we're wrong? You know what I mean? We are right, Simon. We could be wrong. And they, no, no, no. But if you look at the audience score. Somehow Palpatine returned. Yeah, I know. Somehow Palpatine returned. That is a a literal line in that movie, Simon. It is a literal line. <laughs> oh, that was a line you were saying. Yeah. Oh, from the movie. Oh. Take a look at Bano, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Ugh, God, it's just ridiculous. I can't believe it. It just doesn't make sense. Again, some of these choices are are spot on. Uh, you know, Better Call Saul winning a, an award. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank God. Because um, <laughs> it doesn't win enough. Yeah. Like I, I think Quentin Tarantino winning best writing. That's fair. Yeah. I think that's great. I love the Invis- invisible man, but again, the, the, the disrespect of honoring JJ Abrams in the rise of Skywalker over everything else in that category, everything period, full stop. I don't even care. Everything or everyone is just preposterous. Hmm. It's preposterous. It's preposterous. Indeed. And I'm going to go to that LA show for the Saturn Awards next year. And I'm going to I'm going to make a sign that says what the hell were you thinking? And I want you to bring a banner so I can be like look at that banner. Michael. So so, so <laughs> you wait, you didn't see the line. <laughs> did you forget the line? I did, yeah. <laughs> okay line because i was because if i'm bringing the banner i can't well i guess i could say it i guess i could say it but if you just had the banner and called it a banner then i could have just said it you could have set me up for the joke but i, yeah. I didn't know where you were going with that i'm sorry I, me neither i forgot i'm not sure that i should apologize because i feel like that was a terrible setup but anyway let's move on now onto the montage a sequence of our show in which i briefly present the week's smaller news stories as adrian delivers a brisk verdict number one According to Deadline, the mummy actor Brendan Fraser has officially been cast as villain Firefly for DC's live-action Batgirl film starring Leslie Grace as Barbara Gordon, a.k.a. Batgirl. Oh, cool. That's great. Brendan Fraser, now a part of the DC multiverse because he has a main role in uh, Doom Patrol as well, which is a DC property. Making a comeback. That's cool. Number two. As reported by Variety, the HBO hit drama series Succession has officially been renewed for a fourth season. That's awesome. Cool. I still got to watch season two, and I think season three is currently airing. My sister just uh, messaged and I messaged our entire family and, and said, Succession's amazing, and posted the theme song, which I thought was funny, while we were doing this podcast. Hmm. It's moments ago, coincidentally. Why are you looking at your phone, Simon? I didn't. It comes up on my computer. I have a Mac. That's so unprofessional. It's all synced up. Number Ugh. three, as Deadline reports, The Good Place creator Mike Schur has a new TV series coming to Amazon's ad-based streaming service, IMDb TV, and the show will be called Primo. The upcoming comedy is set to follow the coming-of-age story of American author Shay Serrano. Okay. Um, first time I'm ever hearing about IMDb TV. Mm. As far as I'm aware. And you haven't been paying attention because that was featured in the montage and potentially even a main story many weeks ago. I never pay attention, Simon. Number four. According to Deadline, the screenwriters for Transformers Rise of the Beasts, Darnell Metair and Josh Peters, have both been hired on to write the Michael B. Jordan starring live action DC Universe Val Zod Superman TV series for HBO Max. Okay, cool. I don't know. I don't even think that Transformers Rise of the Beasts that's a movie i don't think that's even out yet so uh i I don't really know how i feel about this hopefully it's good it's true interestingly these guys are actually being tapped for like many movies tv series etc that haven't launched yet they're they're prolific it seems like okay that's the word deadline used in fact they're okay. sought after at this point. Interesting. Number five, as Deadline reports, Blue Valentine director Derek Saint-France has been hired on as the director for the upcoming Ryan Gosling starring Wolfman film. Ooh, Ryan the Goose Gosling. I'm actually very excited for this. Hopefully it turns out well. Number six, according to Variety, the Joan Rivers-based biopic limited series that was set to star WandaVision actress Katherine Hahn has been canceled by Showtime due to an ongoing struggle to obtain the life rights to Joan Rivers' story. Oh, that's unfortunate. That was only announced like a, like a month ago, I feel like. Number seven, as reported by Variety, No Time to Die actress Anna de Armas is currently in negotiations to star in the John Wick spinoff film entitled ballerina that is set to be directed by underworld director len weissman oh cool anna de Armas is uh, fantastic number eight as variety reports the upcoming dan weiss and david benioff produced netflix science fiction tv series the three body problem has started to build out its cast list game of thrones actors liam cunningham and john bradley as well as dr strange actor benedict wong and baby driver actor isa gonzalez have all been added to the cast. Cool. I'm uh, I'm curious about this one. Uh, I wonder if they can make a great show after Game of Thrones. Number nine. According to Deadline, Taken star Liam Neeson has been cast as a retired assassin in Marksman director Robert Lorenz's upcoming spy thriller, The Land of Saints and Sinners. 
alongside Game of Thrones actor Kieran Hines. Oh, okay, okay. Number 10. According to Variety, streamer Apple TV Plus is developing an anthology series honing in on the effects of climate change and it is set to be called Extrapolations. The new series will star actors Tobey Maguire, Marion Cotillard, Forrest Whitaker, Meryl Streep, Gemma Chan, Kit Harington, Tahar Rahim, and Sienna Miller. Oh, quite the cast list we got there. Too bad climate change isn't real, Simon. We all know it. Oh, dear. And that concludes the montage. Wow. Just kidding. Climate change is real. Oh, yeah? Oh, I'm glad you believe that. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Simon. What do you got for me, buddy? What do you got for me? I got new releases for you. This is for the week of November the 1st to November the 7th. That's a Monday through a Sunday, as per usual. And I'm going to get right to it. You ready? Monday the 1st, there's a movie coming out. It's called The Claus Family. It's a Netflix original movie, and it's about a kid that finds out his grandfather is actually Santa Claus, but his, his grandfather's sick, so the kid's all like, I'm the only one that can save Christmas. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Next up are a few movies coming out on Tuesday November the 2nd. The first one is Camp Confidential, America's Secret Nazis. This is a Netflix oh. animated documentary about a camp in Washington during World War II where Jewish people were interrogating Nazis. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. A little bit of a plot twist. Son of Monarchs is up next. It's confirmed by Movie Insider in the trailer. This is an HBO Max release. I'm not sure if we're getting it here on Crave. Uh, it's an un, it's about an un, it's about an American Mex. Oh my Jesus Christ! This is an American Mexican drama following a Mexican biologist who must return to his hometown in Mexico following his grandmother's death. He lives in United States at the time of his grandmother's death. Oh, by the way, okay. Yeah. Keyboard Fantasies is up next, and this is confirmed by Movie Insider on the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand movie, and it's a documentary about Beverly Glenn Copeland and his self-released album of the same name of this movie, Keyboard Fantasies. Uh, next up, our movie's coming out on Wednesday the 3rd, and the first one is a movie I'm very excited for called The Harder They Fall. This oh. is a Netflix movie. Oh, baby. It's a Western. It's going to look good. It looks good. I'm very excited for it. It's coming out on Wednesday. That's super exciting, my friend. Are you going to watch it? Idris Alba, Regina King, Zazie Beetz, Lakeith Lake Stanfield. Stanfield. Jinx. You have my relationship and do good. Jonathan Majors. Mm -hmm. <gasps> I'm excited. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm excited, dude. Lords of Scam is up next. This is a Netflix original movie, and it's a doc about a group of individuals who conned the EU carbon quota system only to eventually turn on one another. Okay. Yeah, and the rest of these movies are coming out on Friday the 5th, except for one movie that's going to come out on Sunday the 7th. Uh, I scrolled down and realized that after. And the first one is a movie called Love Hard. It's a Netflix original Christmas romance movie about a girl being catfished by a guy, but only learning about it after flying 3,000 miles to meet him. Oh, Ooh. Jimmy O. Yang is in this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yara is up next, and this is another Netflix original movie. This is based on the true story about a prosecutor that goes to great lengths to find out what happened to a missing 13-year-old. I see. Mm -hmm. A cop movie is up next. This is a Netflix original movie, and it's a documentary that's both fact and fiction, which is uh, kind of confusing, following two Mexican police officers – and their story of the corruption of the Mexican police, Simon. I see. Yeah. We Couldn't Become Adults is up next. And it's another Netflix original movie. And it's a man that's now in his 40s who recalls his past relationship from the 90s after receiving a friend request from that individual. Yeah, you wrote that one. Yeah, I definitely did. Thank you for noting. We're not playing the game, though, Simon. I wrote all of these this week. Oh, okay. Zero to Hero. This is a Netflix original movie. This movie, based on a true story, follows the life of Paralympian So Wa Wei and his relationship with his mother. I see. Okay. Mm. Minakshi Sundareshwar. I apologize for butchering that. This is a Netflix original movie, and it's about a newlywed couple that must deal with the hardships of a long-distance relationship. Hmm. Hmm. Next up is a movie called Finch. This is confirmed by Movie Insider and Apple TV. This is actually an Apple TV Plus original movie starring Tom Hanks, where he is in a post-apocalypse with a robot and his beloved dog. Probably watch that one, actually. I've been mm -hmm. looking forward to that one yeah. for a little while, so I might, yeah, a I might in fact watch it. 
That's good, man. Yeah, there's quite a few movies uh, coming out this week that I'm, I'm curious about, at least. There's three that I that I do want to watch. Uh, the Harder They Fall and this one is are, are two of those threes. Next up is a movie called The Electrical Life of Lewis Wayne. This is confirmed by Movie Insider. It's an Amazon Prime video movie, and it's a biopic following the life of artist Louis Wayne. Louis Wayne. Uh, it stars Benedict Cumberpatch, actually, for this one. Oh, yes. I did see a trailer for this guy. Yeah. Uh, a Man Named Scott is up next, and it's another Amazon Prime video movie, and it's a documentary about Kid Cudi, oh. the, the musical artist. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. Anonymous Animals is up next. Actually, this is another movie that I want to watch. This looks really cool. Uh, this is uh, confirmed by Movie Insider on the Apple TV app. It's a video on demand movie, and it's a horror movie where there are animal-human hybrids that kind of hunt people. Oh. It looks very creepy. It's a French movie. It looks good. Hmm. Looks, okay. Yeah. The trailer, again, is like, it's kind of creepy. It, it's interesting. It, it seems like a very unique premise. Uh, up next is a movie called Beans. This is confirmed by Movie Insider on the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand movie. And it's about a young Mohawk girl during the 1990 Oka crisis. Which is some sort of indigenous crisis. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not I'm not too familiar with it, unfortunately, but it's very well reviewed. It's like an over 90 on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's another movie that I'm I'm curious about. Not sure if I'm going to watch it. Uh, next up is The Beta Test. This is confirmed by the most reliable source on the Internet, m.thehavenumbers.com and, and Movie Insider as well. This is a video on demand movie after receiving a letter for actually, no, this wasn't on video on Movie Insider. This was on Apple TV. Sorry about that. This is a video on demand movie after receiving a letter for a mysterious sexual encounter. A married Hollywood agent finds his life turned upside down. Uh oh, uh oh. Mm -hmm. Next movie coming out is a movie called Spencer. Actually, this is another movie that I'm curious about. It's coming to theaters. This is another interesting one. And it's an imagining of what could have happened during the few days leading up to Princess Diana's death. Oh, oh. Yeah. Is this the one with uh, Kristen, Kristen Stewart? Uh, St yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that was coming out now. It is indeed. Who's directing Simon? that? Let me find out. Let me find out. Let me find out. Spencer movie. Movie 2021. It is being directed by Pablo Lorraine. Hmm. I'm not too sure what he's directed. Pablo Lorraine, what have you directed, sir? Mm. Jackie. Oh, that uh, that's with, uh, what's her name? Padme Amidala. Natalie Portman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I never watched that movie. Interesting. Oh, and Lizzie's story or Li Lizzie's story? Yeah. That's, I think, an Apple TV Plus original series, if I'm not mistaken, with Julianne Moore. Mm, interesting. Yeah, uh, Spencer seems to be being reviewed quite well. It's an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. That's good. Yeah, big mo big week for movies. Big week. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then finally for the day of Friday the 5th, um, it's The Eternals, the Marvel movie. It's coming to theaters. Oh, and that's the movie you're talking about we have to see this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Earlier on in our podcast, episode 70. Yeah, we're, we're watching on Thursday. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. Good, very, good, good. Yeah, I'm very curious about this one, Simon, because it's being reviewed not so well. It's only like a 61% on Rotten Tomatoes. It is the lowest review or the yeah, the lowest scored Marvel movie. It's by Is it 61 now? Mm-hmm. Crazy. And it's literally by an Academy Award winning. It's actually at 60. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it's by an Academy Award winning director, Chloe Zhao. This is unbelievable. I do wonder if it's just divisive. Because people are, are always looking for like a very lighthearted affair with Marvel movies. And I wonder mm -hmm. if this is just not that. And as a result, they just kind of can't can't compute. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm super curious. And I mean, we'll have a review for next week. So next yeah. week's episode, we will talk about this film for sure. Excited. I'm super excited for it. Me too. So. Um, and then finally, uh, a movie coming out on Sunday the 7th. It's Father Christmas is Back. This is a Netflix uh, movie, and uh, Father Christmas is not Santa in this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's it. That's all, baby. That's it. That's all. Oh. Let's wrap it up, Simon. Yes, indeed. Adrian, do you have anything to add before we do wrap this up? Uh, I'd like to, to know if you have anything to tell the audience, anything specific that you want to say. Uh, no. Okay. All right. How about you? Um. Well... You know, I usually close the show, but I guess I would, I'd like to say, take a look at Banner, Michael. <laughs> okay, I will. 
Um, other than that, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, I guess I should go through the same rigmarole I say every week or try to. If you could subscribe to our podcast, I'd very much appreciate it. You can do that on any different streaming service that exists for podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify. It, it doesn't matter. We're on most of them. Um, if there's one that we're not on, let me know at splitfocuspodcast at gmail.com and I can add our podcasts to that service that you prefer. I actually have done this for uh, one particular person who did write into us. Oh. So if you do have any streaming platform that you'd like Spill Focus to be added to, let me know. Other than that, if you have anything, that's, anything to comment to us, perhaps a question or an inquiry, or you'd like to make a weird a uh, weird request of uh, would you rather, perhaps, you can write it to us at splitfocuspodcast at gmail.com for that instead, and we will feature your comments on our podcast. So, um, yeah, do that if you can. Write us a review on Apple Podcasts if you can. Other than that, thank you for listening to the 70th episode of Split Focus, a film and TV podcast. My name is Simon Eady, and this is Adrian Pinter signing off. Yes, Simon, it is I signing off. And we've mentioned uh, that Arrested Development re reference multiple times, but take a look at Banner, Michael. And uh, we never mentioned what was written on the banner. And uh, what was written is actually Batman v Superman is a good movie. Thank you very much. Good day. <laughs> goodbye and take care. I don't believe that's true, but um, goodbye. Take care. Oddly, the banner in that Arrested Development episode is actually is almost just as nonsensical as is Job saying that line. And when Will Arnett says, look up, <laughs> take a look at Banner, Michael. It says family love Michael yeah, I know. <laughs> on the banner. It's <laughs> is equally as nonsensical. Got it. Rest of development. What a fantastic show, man. It's the greatest. Yeah. I might rewatch oh, it. Man, I, I kind of wish they'd come back, but I, I want them to come back with a little bit more consistency. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if they, I don't know if they will. Um, like I would like it to, but again, Jessica Walter has passed away as well. So that's kind of sad. And she oh, yeah, is, that's a good point. yeah, she's a, a core member of that cast and crew. Uh, playing Lucille Bluth, who has some of the funniest lines in that show. For sure. I don't understand the question, and I refuse to answer it. <laughs> Something along those lines. I love how we just had a full conversation when we just closed the podcast. Adrian, goodbye. Take care. Goodbye.